Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Fantastic to see you all here. My name is Matthew Bannister, and I'm the host of a podcast called Folk on Foot. And it does what it says on the tin. It's basically where I go walking with a leading folk musician in a landscape that has inspired their music. And we walk and talk, and they sing and play on location. And one of the people that we've walked with is, I'm delighted to say, Martin Simpson, who is here with us today. Martin is regularly topping the polls of the greatest guitarists of all time. He's been nominated no less than 31 times for Radio 2 Folk Awards. He's won Musician of the Year twice. He's won Album of the Year twice. In fact, I think they're going to ask him to stop taking part because he keeps winning Radio 2 Folk Awards. And, and Martin and I went on a walk, believe it or not, round Scunthorpe because that's where Martin grew up. Um, and what we're doing today is that we are recording a bonus edition of our podcast. So if you applaud and cheer, you will be heard on the podcast, which is going to be fantastic. Martin is going to sing some songs. I'm going to talk to him. And we're going to be treated to some of the songs from his new album, which is not out yet. It comes out at the end of August. And he's written some beautiful songs for that. So would you, first of all, please put your hands together and welcome Martin Simpson. <laughs> We started off with a song, Martin, and, and I think it's a song about your childhood, isn't it? Well, it starts, it starts in my garden in Scunthorpe, which is a place you know. Yeah, I've been to it. You've been there, yeah. Uh, we, we did a walk around Scunthorpe, and to my immense surprise, we ended up at my old house where I grew up. Wally and Drive, Scunthorpe. Wally Scunthorpe. Drive, yeah. It's, it's a, I mean, tourist destination, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, we ended up standing in the back garden and looking at the neighbour's garage, and that's exactly where this, this song starts. Well, do the song. This is called Maps. Perhaps he hears 
the finest music. Black cap, dove, and yellow hammer, bumblebee, and grasshopper, and the gentle choir of rain. And when the walk was over, they would fold the map back carefully, and Ivor would be lost inside until Helen came again. Martin, how you take that idea of you as a kid under the workbench in the garage looking at maps and then expand it out into a story about the power of maps and the power yeah. of journeys. Yeah. Um, maps are a wonderful thing. Maps, maps can take you anywhere you want to go without having to go anywhere, which is a wonderful concept, <laughs> I think. Uh, uh, so we should say that we also... Uh, we went to Scunthorpe. We didn't spend a lot of time in the steelworks, but we went to the woods in Scunthorpe, which is where Martin used to escape to when he was a, a kid. Um, and you went with your dad, didn't you, into the woods? I did. What did your dad teach you when you were in the woods, Martin? A ridiculous amount, actually. He, he, he would just wander along like, <laughs> like he was holding one of those old uh, collections of flowers. You know, I can't remember the, the name of the reverend who wrote the book of uh, British flora, but he would just wander along and he'd go... Oh, that's a so and so, and that's a so and so, and that's a so and so, and it never really stopped. And so, without knowing it, I'm just trying to find out why there's a ringing here, and I'm just going to move around and see if it goes away. I might have to sing sideways to you, Matthew. Actually. Okay, <laughs> it's um, your best side. Yeah, it is. It's good. This is good. <laughs> so, so I, first of all, I would be just learning the names of all these flowers, but then he would he would point out things like a moth's egg on a grass stem, you know, or any birds, everything. So, And I, that's how we live. That's how we are in our family. We walk along going, look, so-and-so. So, so are you one of those people who knows what a bird is when it flies into sight? Usually, yeah. <laughs> I wish I, I, I'd like to say I wish I was much better at bird song, but I'm not very good at bird song. And my dad wasn't either, remarkably. For somebody with a very good ear, a very good singer, you would have thought he would be able to recognise birdsong, but no. It was he was a very interesting character, your dad, wasn't he? He was. When yeah. was he born? 1899. Right, and so how old was he when he had you? 54. He was right. 54. And, and what was it that he taught you, apart from the natural world? Were there things that you learned from him? Oh, he, yeah, he taught me to be a gentleman, I think. <laughs> it's hard to tell, but no, ladies and gentlemen, he did. He, ta <laughs> he taught me to be a gentleman. And uh, he also... He, he sang, and he sang... Um, he sang very, very well indeed. He was one of those fathers who, at the Christmas carol concert, you would die because he was louder than the rest of the... You know, everybody would be singing and you could hear my father. Whoa, giving it that. So. And so was he an inspiration when you started to take up music? Uh, he had been an inspiration because he was such a, such a song-conscious person. But unfortunately... As my, as my elderly aunt said, what kind of music is it that you're into, dear? And I said, folk music. And her response was, oh, that Bolshevik nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> which, which I'm very proud of. But you started very early. You played your first gig in your teens, didn't you? I was 14. Yeah. yeah. At the Burton on Stather Women's Institute, the Dizzy Heights. How did it go? Oh, it was brilliant. <laughs> there, the audience was on its foot. We, we've talked, Martin, about your passion for the natural world and for birds, and I think you have a song on the new album about a kingfisher. I do. Would you sing that for us now? Yes, I'd love to. Tell us how this song came about. Um, I was on tour, and I was at Arundel in Sussex at the Wildfowl Trust down there, which is beautiful. And it was a, a, a winter's day, very bright, very clear winter's day, I think it's the Duke of Norfolk that owns Arundel Castle. So the day was slightly marred by the fact that he was having his, his open day at the shoot. So I was walking around <laughs> looking at wildfowl, 
to the sound of shotguns going pop, pop, every few seconds like that, knowing that up the road people were shooting pheasants, which is not actually my favourite uh, pastime, as you can imagine. So that was a, a bit of a mar. Um, but I found myself in a hide overlooking a scrape, you know, a, a shallow pool of water. And it was myself and an elderly lady with some very underpowered uh, binoculars. And I suddenly realized that in the middle of this scrape, about 40 feet in the air, it was a kingfisher. And it was so utterly stationary that with my good binoculars, I was looking for the wire that it was sitting on. And then I realized that it was actually hovering and I didn't know kingfishers could hover and it was completely stationary and the sun was on its back and it was staggeringly bright and staggeringly beautiful and then of course it dropped and caught a fish and was off so that's where the song started but the, the, the song in the song starts now in my back garden in Sheffield and it starts with the dawn chorus which is actually pretty hard to imagine right at this point in the day. Ivy owl calls the night to rest And the small birds carol the creeping dawn And the jackdaws they crackle across the grey sky And all is well on this frosty morn
That's just one of the songs from Martin's forthcoming album out at the end of this month called Rooted. And you called it Rooted, Martin. Is it about feeling your place and, and putting down roots in the landscape? It's about connection musically as well as naturally, if you like. So a lot of the material on, on the record actually, in terms of my experience, goes back a long way musically. You know, some of the songs I first heard when I was 10 years old and that kind of thing. And uh, the great thing about the music, as far as I'm concerned, is that it continues to change. And you can do with it what you will. So you can rearrange things that you heard years and years ago and yeah. they come back sounding fresh? That the tune there for Kingfisher, I kept trying to write a tune for it and it wouldn't have it. So that's actually a, a ballad called The Fair Flower of Northumberland, which I learned from my old friend Dick Gochen in about 1971. Right. And, and uh, really, you know, I was trying to write a new tune, but it didn't want to have a new tune. It wanted to have that. So you don't fight it eventually. And it's difficult to talk about the source of inspiration, isn't it? I mean, I, I talk to a lot of artists and they say, well, it's just ephemeral. You can't really put it into words. But I wonder if there is something that sparks a song. Is it, is it a, a figure on the guitar or is it a little image like the image of the kingfisher? You know, is, is there always something that's at the root of it? Yeah, I mean, it tends not to be a figure on the guitar. The guitar is the guitar is what it is. The guitar is, the guitar will do things on its own. It doesn't, you know. I don't I tend not to write from the guitar. I tend to write from. Ooh, look at that. <laughs> <laughs> so something you've seen, something you've heard. Yeah. Um, and and storytelling is at the heart of it all. It seems to me. You you you. You weave stories out of the images that you, you've seen. It, it's all about stories. It's all about the emotional content of a given situation. Um, so this, this next song I'm going to do, I was walking on the beach at Slapton Sands in Devon on April the 11th, 2014. Yes, I do take notice of these things. <laughs> and uh, it has an, an incredibly dark history down there. There was a... A f an operation called Operation Tiger, which was a rehearsal for the D-Day landings, which went horrendously wrong right there in Devon. And I was thinking about that event and feeling a bit grim in this beautiful place. I was feeling grim. And then all of a sudden, over my head, off the sea, came what was for me the first swallow of spring for that year. And so I wrote this which is called Dark, Swift and Bright Swallow, and it's, it's a celebration of those, what I consider to be utterly miraculous birds. So the swallows and the house martins are what we see around here, but uh, the swifts are the ones perhaps that, while I tune my bass string, Swifts are utterly marvellous birds. When they leave England, which they will be doing in the next few weeks, the, the birds will not land until they return to England next May. So they'll probably fly about 7,000 to 10,000 miles in the next year before they land. And they'll sleep in the air. And I really like that. They wake up go to sleep at 10,000 feet and fly around like that and wake up exactly where they went to sleep. Now, I can't even do that in a Premier Inn, so, you know, it's, <laughs> it's very impressive to me. <laughs> April sun on slapped to me 
Between the lagoon and the haunted sea, I was thinking of war and cruelty. When spring's first swallow split the sky, and I was lifted above all care as the swallow swung through the salted air. Come from savannah and desert and sea to mark another year. shall always return bright swallow sweet spirit of stockyard and barn you lighten our days with all of your charms bring hope to the sailor on the wide sea and mark another year for me Slapped and Sands yes, in Devon. We did. And I think I, I don't have to do much more than say, Thereby Hangs Another Story. Yeah, I, I wrote that song and I went back there and played it. And a gentleman called Dean Small came and introduced himself to me. And Dean is the son of a man called Ken Small. And Ken moved to that part of the world from actually from Immingham, from North Lincolnshire, uh, in the early 70s having found a guest house, having discovered this place down there that he thought was just heaven. And he got down there, and as sometimes happens to people, everything that was revealed to him was not sufficient to make him happy, and he had a nervous breakdown. And a fisherman friend of his said, well, you know what you should do? You should take up beach combing, because it is the most soothing thing you could possibly do. So that's what he did. He started to beach comb. And he was amazed at the amount of shrapnel and things of that nature that he found. And he wondered what was going on. And then one night there was a massive storm. And the, I don't know if you've ever seen the effect of one of those storms down on the south coast there. But they just roll away the beach. And so what had been a beach sloping at an angle like that the next morning was a 20-foot a cliff. And what was revealed, amongst other things, were two huge mines, naval mines, and just a battlefield, really. And he determined to find out what had gone on there. And his fisherman friend said, well, I'll tell you something that went on here. There's something in the water out there, and we don't know what it is, but we've been snagging our nets on it for years. So Ken said to himself, I'm, I'm going to get to the bottom of this. I'm going to find out. So he got a diver, and the diver did get to the bottom and discovered an amphibious Sherman tank on the seafloor. <laughs> a tank, an amphibious tank. Who knew there were things called amphibious tanks? They were called duplex drive Sherman tanks. 
They had two propellers on the back. They had the usual tracks. And they had tented sides, canvas sides. They'd come off a landing craft into the water and they would go along using the propellers until it was, you know, until the beach did that and then they could drop the sides and drop, drop the, the use of the propellers and go on to land. This one had failed in 1944 and had been lying there on the bottom of the sea. He determined he'd salvage it, so he went to the British Army and said, I found this, I'd like to salvage it. Can I get some help? And they went, no, you can't, you nasty little man, go away. And which they repeated for the next 10 years. He got in touch with the American government and they said, yeah, you can salvage it, but you have to buy it. So he, he bought it for 50 bucks and it took him 10 years and eventually he hauled this thing out of the sea and when he got it to the top of the beach, he thought to himself, well, this is all very well but I want to make a memorial over there. How am I going to get the tank from here to over there? And it had been on the seabed for 40 years. He got it onto the road and it rolled on its tracks. It just rolled because the grease was still in place. From, was from there 19... any wildlife in the, in the tank? Oh, there was indeed. There were, there were a number of six-foot conger eels in the turret of the tank, all of which, alas, died, of course, when it came ashore but they had there's a great photograph of this guy standing on the the tank hauling out this eel which is the same size as himself but it became an obsession with him didn't it he 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 wrote a book called the forgotten dead because what had happened on april the 27th of 1944 was that the americans were doing an exercise sailing a line of landing craft out of lime bay into start bay where they were going to land on the beach it all went horribly wrong, and a flotilla of German e-boats, which motor torpedo boats, got inside the line of the landing craft and attacked the American forces on the beach. The English just assumed, as usual, that the Americans were using live ammunition, so the destroyer on the outside of the line did nothing, and a 1,000 American troops were killed uh, in the space of about an hour. And so this story struck you? It struck me. It was hidden. It was completely hidden, this story. What struck me was the fact that Ken had done this thing against all odds. He'd, he'd found this tank, he'd salvaged the tank, and then he wrote the book about the exercise. He brought it to the attention of the world that this had happened, that these people had been killed and it had been entirely shut down. Nope, we're not, you know, nope. Oh, it's not going to be reported. It still hasn't been officially reported. It's only the actions of Ken Small that we know about this. It is now celebrated, in inverted commas, by the two governments, but it's only recent. And it's celebrated in your song. Or it's he celebra is celebrated in your song. Absolutely. Should not be 
something that told him a forgotten story of young men dying in a burning sea, determined to salvage the truth from the seafloor. Ten years of struggle it turned out to be until the Sherman tank rolled on its own two tracks without any help from the powers that be. Ken sits in his car by the tank at Torcross, his window is down and he's happy to share, share his sandwich with starlings, his story with strangers, he has nothing but time for those that care. He got a letter from the president, another from the witch, late congratulations from the privileged and the rich, and he got the D-Day mandolin from the lady in Torquay who knew she had a gift to give and where the gift should be his money was gone his marriage was broken he sat on the shoreline he never grew old but he found peace and treasure down on the shoreline he found truth and healing and the story he told I sort of feel the need to do my radio presenter thing and say, uh, you're listening to the great Martin Simpson of BBC Country File Live, recording an episode of the podcast Folk on Foot. If you've just joined us, uh, welcome. Thank you very much indeed for, for coming. Ma Martin, I, I feel a sense of, of passion in your songs. I feel a sense of emotion. Um, and, and I wonder sometimes if there's a sense of, of anger. Of, of, of You want to talk about things that you see being wrong in the world or things that you see... Uh, as, as issues that are affecting ordinary people's lives. Absolutely, I think uh, I think one of the main reasons, in, if you, if I look at my sort of collection of songs that I've written, that they are all of them written out of a mixture of love and anger, really, and sometimes more one than the other. <laughs> what makes you angry? Injustice. Unfairness, stupidity. How long have you got? <laughs> and I mean, we, I've talked to lots of people about what is the definition of folk music, and, and one of the definitions that I know Mark Radcliffe, who presents on Radio 2, says is that it's the, it's the music of the working people. Does that work for you as a definition? It's the music of real people, um, working or not. <laughs> But um, actually, the real definition of folk music, for those of you who are truly into folk music, you'll know it's music that accompanies a raffle. That's, uh... <laughs> but, but I wonder if you're looking at the world from the bottom up, as it were. You know, I, <laughs> Sorry? I, I, there was a, well, there was a rather scathing reference to the, the Duke of Arundel or the Earl of Arundel and, and his shooting and all the rest of it. I wonder if you come at the world from the point of view of, of us rather than them. Uh, well, I... I there is a there is a, a, a sense of injustice which is very very clear to me you know people are not treated well they could be treated well it'd be very easy for us not to be uh, struggling in the way that we are but there are people who will not change because they're invested in the position that exists in the status quo and yes that makes me very angry indeed as far as looking from the bottom up, I don't know. I, look, I like looking at the sky. You know? so. and I'm just thinking about a song that I heard on your, on your new album called uh, Who Will Shoe Your Pretty Little Foot, which I thought was going to start out as being a kind of love song. But then in the middle, all of, all of a sudden, a verse comes out of nowhere and hits you in the solar plexus. And, and you obviously had something you wanted to say and you, you added that verse in. Can you tell us about why you did that? Yeah. Um, well, I rewrote everything except the first verse. This is a... It's an old ballad. It's a fragment of a ballad called The Lass of Loch Royal, which is utterly tragic, awful, um, 
about grief and loss and unfairness and magic and 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 it has a beautiful tune and I was playing the tune as an instrumental and I couldn't stop playing it as an instrumental and then I started to sing the first verse and then it started to 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 rewrite itself and there's one of the verses that I I uh, I talked about illusion, greed, and hate. And I read it to my friend Martin Taylor, who's a Buddhist, and he said, illusion, greed, and hate, those are, in Buddhism, those are referred to as the three poisons. So that got into... <laughs> I'd, I'd already written it, and I thought, well, that was good, that was pretty good. Chimed. I'm inventing Buddhism as I go along. <laughs> Would so you sing I, it for us? I will, love, I'd love to, yeah. To ask you a question, a personal question, really, about how it felt going on the on the podcast walk with us round Scunthorpe and revisiting your old childhood haunts. Was that an emotional experience for you? It was inc- extr- It really was. I was not expecting it to be as emotional as it was. Some st- we found some stuff, didn't we? We did. We unearthed some memories. We talked about your mum and your dad. Yeah. And, and, ha- and, and going back to the garden of your childhood home, was that emotional? That was ridiculous. That was almost <laughs> too much. We saw the apple tree, didn't we, where you used to hide as a kid? The apple tree, my jungle, yeah, and all mine to explore. It was, it was wonderful, but also going... 
I really liked going into the woods to Twigmore Woods and, and having all those memories come back from there. That was very special indeed. Well, it's been amazing to have you here with us today. Um, and I, I wonder if people might have thought that your songs tend to be a bit on the melancholy side. I wonder if you've got something to end off with from the new album, Rooted, that is uh, perhaps a little bit more whimsical, shall we say? Well, it's whimsical, but it's dark too. I, uh, I, I like a bit of darkness, you know. It's, this is a, a folk song, a traditional song, and it comes from the California Gold Rush. And it's almost... I don't quite how to put this, but it's... It's definitely a composition, you know. And I think the person who wrote it could possibly have done well with a TV series, you know. <laughs> What's it called? It's called Joe Bowers. And it uh, goes like this. Oh, 
sad affair About Sal marrying the butcher And the baby having red hair Whether it was a girl or a boy child The letter never said It only said the baby's hair Was inclined to be red Ladies and gentlemen, Martin Simpson. Thank you very much. And just to say, Martin's album is out at the end of this month. It's called Rooted. Listen to our podcast. It's called Folk on Foot. You'll find us at folkonfoot.com or on your podcast app on your phone. Please tune in. Thank you very much for listening to us today, and goodbye.